Thank you, David. It's great to be here. I'm very much looking forward to the day, and I have the honor of um, introducing Harvey Feinberg, who is um, president of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, um, and he's previously served as president of the uh, U.S.'s Institute of Medicine, which is now the National Academy of Medicine. He was the provost at Harvard University and also served as dean um, at Harvard Chan School of Public Health. But what's more important to the SMDM community, and we are very indebted to Dr. Feinberg, is that he is one of the founders of the society. Um, he also, interestingly, chaired the second annual meeting of the society in 1980 um, that was hosted in Washington, D.C., uh, not virtually, live. Um, he was also the president of our society uh, in those early years. He's devoted much of his academic career to the fields of health policy and medical decision making, and his research areas have included global health, the assessment of medical technology, evaluation and use of vaccines, and dissemination of medical innovations, all very much part of uh, the community that's gathered here today. He's uh, authored uh, many books, including Clinical Decision Analysis, Innovators in Physician Education, and The Epidemic That Never Was. Uh, interesting at this moment to think about that. Um, that was an analysis of the controversial U.S. immunization program against swine flu in 1976. But turning to this year in the midst of uh, the pandemic, uh, his background uh, currently with the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine is that he's appointed to serve as chair to the Standing Committee on Emerging Infectious Diseases and the 21st Century Health Threats. The Standing Committee was formed at the request of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy um, to assist the federal government with its response to COVID-19 um, and is very busy putting out um, uh, answers to many requests. He also wrote an optimistic article for the New England Journal of Medicine in April entitled 10 Weeks to Crush the Curve. Uh, we are now interested in knowing what Harvey is thinking uh, and um, having him share his thoughts with us today. Uh, very much appreciate your being here, Harvey. Again, we are indebted to you uh, for all your service to the society, and we will be even more indebted after uh, hearing your thoughts today at this important time um, in the response to the COVID pandemic. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Good morning to you. Uh, I want to Thank you and uh, Drs. Prosser and Sandra Schmidler for inviting me directly to participate in today's session. And uh, I want to uh, add my thanks uh, to Dr. Schwartz and Meltzer for organizing this important conference. The theme uh, for my opening comments this morning is decision making in a global pandemic, modeling matters. When I thought about this topic, it brought to mind an experience when I was a medical intern working in the emergency room. And uh, one night in the middle of the night, writing up a patient I had just admitted uh, in the ER, there was a surgical resident sitting across from me in the residence room, also writing uh, notes for a patient that he had just admitted. At one point, he looked up at me and he said, I've just had a revelation. And so to sleepily, I glanced up and said, what's that? He said, do you realize every single person on the planet is either op, pre-op, or post-op? So I thought about that uh, in connection with today's program because Really, uh, it's not so far that surgical mindset from thinking that the world is either in the midst of COVID, was pre-COVID, or will become post-COVID at some point in the future. Today, uh, in October of 2020, many more than 10 weeks after I wrote the article that Kathy alluded to, we are squarely in the midst of the COVID pandemic, definitely in the time of COVID. This pandemic, in a way, is both a surprise and utterly anticipatable. 
Emerging infections as a class have been recurring for decades uh, that we have recorded. And just in the space of the last 20 years, we had SARS the first, we had MERS a decade later, both coronaviruses, we had the 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic, we had Zika, we had Ebola, and now, of course, we have SARS-CoV-2 uh, and COVID. What characterizes all of these is that they are zoonotic transmissions. They emerge into the human population from animals. Most of the time, zoonoses do not transmit efficiently from one human to another. Many of us will recall the uh, avian flu scare in early part of this, uh, of this century. Uh, so most of those zoonoses are not serious ongoing problems. But for us, SARS uh, and SARS-CoV-2 were quite serious. The first SARS uh, was not as efficiently transmitted. It did produce a much higher mortality. It was about one in 10 of those with clinical conditions did uh, die from uh, the original SARS. But the current SARS, for purpose of thinking about modeling, has a number of very distinctive epidemiologic attributes. First is, of course, its relatively high transmissibility. Secondly, and uh, as we're learning, particularly from a very important study just released uh, this week in science, the virus is transmitted typically by a relatively small number of relatively high emitters of the virus. In the study in India, for example, more than 70% of those infected did not actually transmit uh, to any of their, of their contacts. A third feature of this virus is the remarkably wide spectrum of clinical expression where 40% or more will be utterly asymptomatic throughout the course of their illness. Others will get sick and yet others will be uh, fatal conditions. And the spectrum is very dependent on underlying conditions, including a remarkable age relationship. Uh, this disease is capable of being transmitted during the asymptomatic stage. And that puts it in a very special and challenging uh, category. And finally, it's clearly global in scope, but its expression, not only in different parts of a country as large as the United States, but from country to country, is extraordinarily variable in the way in which it has created and presented as a serious problem. In any given day in the United States, for example, uh, now we might have as many as 150 new cases on average. In Japan, the number will be more like five. So it introduces, for the purpose of understanding and trying to model many challenges about the differential expression, epidemiology, clinical course, and of course, strategies to contain and contend. COVID is really multiple crises rolled up in one. It's a personal medical crisis. It's a public health crisis. It has been a clinical care crisis. It is an ongoing economic crisis. And it's also a social crisis, exposing and exacerbating disparities in health and striking at public confidence. And finally, it also raises critical challenges for international relations as a global problem that really cannot be solved anywhere until it is solved everywhere. So thinking about it analytically, we could characterize COVID-19 in a number of pertinent ways. First, uh, the severity of this disease has elevated its visibility and brought to the fore many interests from groups, scientists, academics, businesses, and others that were not working on viruses, much less on COVID, 
but at the present time, there are more than 700 prospective treatments, vaccines, and other interventions under development and being tested in various ways. Secondly, because it's an emerging disease, even though as a coronavirus, it may share certain attributes with previous coronavirus outbreaks, it is a distinctive novel entity. So we haven't seen anything exactly like it before. Therefore, it introduces heightened uncertainty about its clinical and epidemiologic expression, its amenability to various interventions. For example, it was very uncertain the degree to which the summer months might bring a degree of respite from the virus. And now as we're facing the winter, questions about the emergence of additional cases potentially in conjunction with other respiratory viruses that have a seasonal character, particularly influenza, but also adenoviruses and others. Third, the coronavirus COVID pandemic is a highly complex entity. It has many, many parts and many different relations among these parts, some tightly coupled, some loosely coupled, some relations that are dampening, some that are amplifying in the circuit sense. These multiple interacting and interdependent spheres from the viral sphere to the human sphere to the social and institutional spheres, these create many challenges for adequately modeling the events and circumstances that we want to consider. The multiplicity of actors and decision makers involved also complicates the problem. And there are multiple loci for decision making at a local, state, and national level in the United States, at the international level, for individuals, for the community, for institutions, for healthcare systems. All of these are important settings for critical decisions and modeling related to COVID. And finally, we cannot emphasize enough the dynamic nature of the circumstances that apply to COVID. The rapidly evolving expression of the disease in different parts of the world, the emergence of new knowledge about the virus, about the disease, the advent of new technologies, to contain or treat or manage in different ways for purposes of prevention or treatment uh, or diagnosis. All of these add to the complexity of modeling. And if you consider the special case of the United States, we can add additional layers of complication, including at a public health and cultural level, a set of values and mores that puts a strong emphasis on individual liberty and relatively less emphasis on collective welfare. Contrast, for example, a culture such as in Japan, where anyone who would not be wearing a mask would feel humiliated if anyone else became sick because of their neglect. Secondly, importantly for policymaking, the United States federal system in which we have never from the founding of the Republic fully resolved the issues of federalism and sovereignty among the states and the federal government during a crisis produces a number of added tensions, uncertainties, and complications in dealing coherently and consistently with the pandemic. And finally, of course, this is an election year in the United States. The political overtone to the pandemic is yet a further complication in dealing effectively with the outbreaks, with the pandemic, with the problems that arise in the tensions between the federal and state governments, for example. I can recall well 
back in the 1970s during the last effort to deal with a pandemic to immunize the entire US population against the threat of what was then perceived as a swine influenza potential pandemic. It was also an election year and some people were also suspicious of decision making by then President Gerald Ford because of the fact that it was an election time. But that is nothing compared to the experience that we are facing today. Modeling as an approach to coping with a pandemic from an analytic systematic point of view offers a number of advantages when trying to come to grips with a situation that is as urgent, complex, dynamic, multifaceted, and fraught as COVID-19. Let me just mention five critical features of modeling. First, they represent a systematic way for analysts to bring the knowledge and understanding of scientists, clinicians, public health professionals, and other experts to bear directly on the questions and decisions that decision makers, policy makers, clinicians, the public, public health leaders are all facing. Secondly, modeling can be a basis for assessment that provides a ready means of communication and understanding across analytic and policymaking spheres. It's a tool that fits in a much larger context of the relations between experts and policymakers, uh, science and government officials, a much larger topic, but modeling is a critical tool in that relationship. Third, modeling in a complex situation, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, is a way to systematically characterize all the relevant elements and relationships that determine the course of events in the real world. Fourth, models allow an analyst and a decision maker to focus on any one key part of the problem without losing sight of the whole and without missing out on the key interdependencies that will affect the decision. And finally, properly constructed, models enable an analyst and a decision maker to incorporate dynamic elements as new understanding, new scientific discovery, new knowledge, new technologies, new strategies all emerge. In other words, modeling can be a very flexible tool to provide a sophisticated approach to comparing and choosing. Now, COVID has raised and continues to raise, as David alluded, a plethora of questions and challenges that are amenable uh, to modeling. Just to indicate a few, the fundamental tracking and projecting the course of the pandemic, gauging the impact of the vari variety of possible combinations of public health interventions and other practices to contain the virus, trying to trace the relations among economic consequences and medical public health consequences, the dual crises of this pandemic. Thinking about optimal strategies that would apply to individual patients, apply to a community at risk, apply to a particular work site or school setting, all relevant. Examining the special role of social inequities, and the differential burden of disease on different parts of the population. Projecting for this winter and beyond the combined effects of the COVID pandemic with the possible overlay of influenza 
adenovirus and other winter respiratory viruses. And very importantly, thinking through the optimal sequencing stratification of vaccine candidates. Once a vaccine becomes available, that sequencing and of application in a smart way can make a huge difference in the rate of spread and capacity to cope with the pandemic. For all of these challenging reasons, for all of the advantages that modeling brings, we're part of the thinking at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation when we chose to sponsor a series of COVID modeling efforts a number of which uh, will serve as a backdrop for your discussions through the course of the day. As a general observation, modeling serves one of three overarching purposes. First, it can be descriptive, primarily a way to express what the situation is, highlighting key aspects, particularly in the course of tracking and monitoring. Secondly, a model can be predictive. A model would estimate future variables of interest, outcomes that we care about, whether it's hospitalizations, deaths, numbers of cases, numbers who become immune, all based on the relevant inputs and predicated relationships. And third, and most importantly for us in the Society of Medical Decision Making, Models provide decision support. They can be used to compare different choice scenarios in terms of the projected effects and their bearing on the desired outcomes. In practice, many models actually combine elements of the descriptive, the predictive, and the decision support. I'd like to just uh, briefly uh, identify eight dimensions of modeling that may be useful to keep in mind through the course of the day of thinking and discussing uh, the various models and how they apply, what their advantages and potential limitations are. I group these under the categories of structure, purpose, outcomes, methods, data, uncertainty, updatability, and reproducibility. These eight attributes relate to the usefulness, the clarity, the relevance, the timeliness, and the reliability of models as aids to decision-making. Just a word on each. Structure. Every model is a simplification. It entails choices about what to include and what to omit. Underlying assumptions are always key. Are they exposed? Did the modeler incorporate key components in a sensible way? Are any essential pieces for the purpose of that model left out? And is there a good balance between comprehensiveness and comprehensibility? In other words, is it sufficiently complete and still understandable? Secondly, purpose, the suitability and clarity of the purpose. Is the purpose of the model clear? Is it well laid out? Does it serve the intended role for aid in decision making? Third, outcomes. Did the modeler choose the outcomes of greatest interest and relevance to the decision maker? Fourth, on methods, are the choices of methods and modeling technique well suited to the purpose and the circumstances? And has the modeling exercise itself technically been executed proficiently? Data, have the most appropriate, accurate, current data been incorporated into the model? Coping with uncertainty. Have the uncertainties, both in the assumptions and in the data, as well as in the relationships, been specified? Have the results been quantified in a probabilistic way so that one can understand the range of 
probability associated with any projection related to the model and are the influential factors, those elements that make the most difference to resolving the uncertainty, have they been properly identified? Updatability. In light of the dynamics of a situation such as COVID, in knowledge, in technology, in discovery, is the model capable of being updated and in a time frame that is still relevant to the decision maker? And finally, reproducibility. Reproducibility, when it comes to modeling, involves both code and data. Has the analyst made code and data available so that others using the same inputs can obtain the same results? Reproducibility with replicability are two of the key hallmarks of science that affects the reliability. All of these elements, these eight elements, contribute to the usefulness, the clarity, the relevance, the timeliness, and the reliability of the modeling exercise. In conclusion, I just want to bring to mind a remark of one of the titans of biostatistics of the last century, Fred Mosteller. Professor Mosteller once observed, it is easy to lie with statistics. It is even easier to lie without them. And in that spirit, I think we might say it is easy to make mistakes based on models. It is even easier to make mistakes without them. Our hope is that the models that you and many others are crafting will contribute to deeper understanding, new insights, and better choices in the time of COVID. And looking beyond, to the post-COVID era, we can hope that the spirit of scientific collaboration, open exchange, and cooperation amongst all of the analytic community and the scientific community can be sustained in a way that helps us solve not just future pandemics, but future challenges for health and for society. Thank you so much for the privilege of being with you this morning. I uh, wish you uh, wonderful discussions through the course of the day and look forward especially to keeping in touch with the modeling and modeling successes that emerge from your work today and beyond. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to start with the, the first question, if that's okay, as those questions begin. Um, I'm really curious what your thoughts are as, as an ongoing leader, but, but you know, with a history of having led the, the National Academy of Medicine or the time Institute of Medicine about the role that the science establishment can play in, in influencing policy. And I'm, I'm curious in particular if you have any reflections about lessons for the future for the American science establishment in influencing policy and also, given the international membership of the society, observations about how science has interacted with government in other nations and what lessons there might be for countries around the world from this. Well, thank you for a really important question. Uh, the relation of science to policymakers is a matter literally of life and death in a case of COVID. And so, it's a two-way street. A policymaker has to be prepared and able to take advantage of the best science. And scientists, for their part, have to be prepared to present the information in a way that is understandable and usable. I would stress two key features. The first is humility. The problem of overconfidence based on meager data has dogged the relations between science and policymakers in emerging infections, infectious disease, in health broadly, and frankly, in many other spheres as well. 
being mindful of our own limitations of what is known and knowable at us at a moment in time and being able to take account of the appropriate spectrum of responsible and informed science this is really a key starting point a key feature and the second point i would uh, i would emphasize is communication and communication skills very importantly particularly in dealing uh, with a complex situation and conveying critical messages to a public and to a policy making community remember that what convinces you about evidence and your ability to cope with uncertainty and your ability to manage in a way that balances simultaneously many relevant considerations may not be attributes of uh, the lay public. And we, you know, are very fond of training ourselves to focus on the science, focus on the data, focus on the evidence. And we believe that the plural of anecdote is not evidence. At the same time, when communicating, conveying clearly the state of science, we have to be able to speak in terms that resonate and have real meaning to the listener without distortion. And that is a very difficult balancing act to convey. How to convey honestly and accurately in an undistorted way that is still understandable. So humility and communication, David, those are two points in the relationship from the scientific side that I would emphasize. I think, I think those are wonderful answers. And interestingly, the very top question in the chat right now resonates with this and gives me a chance to, to build on it. The question, which is from Heather Gold, is how do we best explain uncertainty in models to lay folks? How do we explain changing scientific evidence? I, that is science that, that isn't static. With such suspicion of science and ideas for how to engage and help um, lay people understand. How, how do we do that? And, and then I'll add to that, you know, I think one of the challenges of this is that oftentimes you don't have the degree of confidence that people want. So what they want you to say isn't what you feel you can scientifically say. And so there's an added tension there. That's so true. Uh, they, uh, both an excellent question from Heather and David, your point uh, at, the, at the conclusion are really challenging parts of, uh, of this. You know, uh, one reason humility is so important is that it also conditions the degree to which you emphasize with what level of confidence the beliefs as they are available today and not beyond those beliefs. Uh, John Maynard Keynes, the economist, the famous economist, was accused by a critic of uh, being inconsistent and uh, now espousing uh, recommendations and policies that contradicted uh, his previous uh, views. And his reply was, when the facts change, I change my mind. What, sir, do you do? <laughs> and so scientists have to be prepared to say, yes, we learn as we go. It does mean that, uh, again, being able to express that degree of uncertainty, uh, to put it in terms that uh, people understand. For example, many people have become familiar with uh, predictions about the weather. And they understand that when they're told there's a 60% chance of rain, it doesn't mean it's going to rain that day. And so uh, sometimes if you can connect your messaging of uncertainty to a more familiar arena in the mind of the individual so they can frame it in that context, as long as it's not distorting of your message, that can be a one trick in a way to try to convey that uncertainty in an understandable and useful way. Great, great. So our, our current top question is, is from Anton Avanitsa, apologies for pronunciation. And the question is, 
How do we encourage more foundations like MORE to invest in modeling projects beyond COVID-19 models? How do we convince philanthropy of the value of simulations, cost-effectiveness analyses, and so on? And what role can or should SMDM play in that? It's a great question uh, and really important for the future of uh, the work that many of us involved uh, in SMDM uh, care so much about. Uh, modeling can be very abstract for people and hard to understand. Uh, one of the things that I uh, am hopeful will emerge from the uh, COVID experience will be a number of instances where one can point to the benefits of modeling to demonstrate new insights that actually had an important influence on policy. So to cite one example, modeling analyses of diagnostic test strategies, which tend to emphasize the performance of the test, not as an isolated single event, but as part of a strategy of repetition with the attributes of individual tests combined over a series of tests and the insights that can be gained according to what timing of tests and what attributes of tests in terms of sensitivity, specificity, time to return of answers, etc. This exercise can be very valuable in informing and shaping institutional policies of how often and what kinds of tests do we employ. As one example, I hope that out of the uh, COVID experience, one will be able to document a number of ways in which models provided added clarity, added insight, added confidence in the steps that were being taken and uh, should be taken in coping with the pandemic. You know, when it comes to support from uh, philanthropies like the Moore Foundation, uh, so much depends really on the fundamental interests and foci chosen by uh, the benefactors, the individuals who have underwritten the private philanthropy. But when it comes to government agencies, uh, emphasis of the relevance and important finding allies from adjacent or uh, uh, related fields in our instance, such as engineering, uh, can be a very important part of building the case for additional focal support uh, on models and analytic strategies for coping with these complex situations. So uh, it's not an easy task, but uh, it can be done and evidence built up from the experience can make a difference. That's great. One of our questions in the question and answer um, session is, is about sort of the variability in practice patterns by, by hospitals and over time and, and outcomes. And I think this is a general concern, but is a concern particularly for modeling exercises because um, uh, the model obviously assumes a bunch of things about a given context and there's so much variability in context. I'm curious if you could comment a little bit about, about that tension and about um, various strategies that you see as useful in the context of that. You know, this is really uh, a, a challenge to the art of model building uh, around the science. And those are the choices of the degree of differential specificity you build into the model in order to more accurately portray the variability in the factors that you're trying to take account of. And from my vantage point, I have a very uh, practical empirical guide to this. When your modeling uh, exercise in hypothetical instance can demonstrate that that level of differential representation does not materially affect the results that you can obtain, then it's a good signal you ought to simplify and you can make that generalization. But when that differential choice in different hospitals, for example, David, as you're describing, uh, does have a material effect on the outcomes, then 
you have an obligation to do your best to try to incorporate and represent that added measure of variability and complexity. Uh, so it's, it is really conditioned on the circumstances of the particular case and purpose that you're trying to serve with your model. Yeah, one of the fascinating things I've noticed locally is that um, people working at our institution who I never particularly thought of as modelers, all of a sudden are, are modelers. And they're, they're building their own models of how many ICU beds we're gonna need and what admission rules we should do. And um, you know it's wonderful and exciting that they're doing this, but I, I can't help but imagine that um, this is happening all around the country and all around the world. And that if there were tools that brought these back into the hands of local modelers and we thought a little more as a society about how to do that, it could really um, increase our impact potentially. That's a really interesting observation, uh, David. On the one hand, you do want a thousand flowers to bloom. You want people uh, to use uh, systematic, organized approaches in thinking through the choices and uh, options that they are able to consider. But you raise a really interesting and I think potentially uh, quite uh, telling idea of whether, in a sense, uh, some effort to codify, embrace, and prioritize among questions where modeling could be uh, applied, if that could be more successful as a group exchange and a set of discussions among those with modeling expertise, as well as those with the problems that need to be modeled, uh, could not give us a better sense of prioritization. Uh, it, you know, you want to be sure that as a, a modeling community, there's not a, uh, let's say, bias toward the solvable as opposed to the important and pressing. And so uh, that interaction might be a really interesting way to engender the next generation of challenging questions for modeling. And the other aspect of what you're describing is the fact that uh, if many, many, many places are facing the same problem, the idea that they are independently crafting their own model and gathering their own data and not learning from one another sufficiently is another real uh, handicap in being optimally informed and able to proceed uh, in a way that takes advantage of best knowledge and practice. Really important point. Um, um, one, one additional question for me and then I'll turn back to the others. Um, we've seen an incredible change in the role of technology in our lives and how we communicate. You know, Zoom perhaps being one of the most striking, but against the backdrop of, of social media and all, all the other changes that have happened. I, I recently was looking at some of the highest cited articles in, in journals. And one of the amazing shocks to me is that almost all the highest cited journal articles ever are about COVID. And so we have had this absolutely, you know, I know first an incredible increase in the number of submissions to journals and, and, and now uh, this tremendous degree of attention. But, you know, so much of this attention is in social media. And so I, I was wondering if, given your interest in policy and relevance to the population and the sort of spread of all of this and democratization of the movement of knowledge, if you have advice about how individual scientists, but also the society should think about its presence in social media and, and the use of those sorts of mechanisms to move scientific information. This is another, I think, big challenge for uh, all of us who care about public understanding of science and a condition like COVID. You know, COVID is, uh, you know, like the proverbial morning hanging. It concentrates the mind. Uh, and uh, what has happened and is so extraordinary is the number of people in any walk of life, not just virologists, scientists, clinicians, public health experts, but regardless of where you are, who now uh, wake up thinking about, worrying about, concerned about, interested in uh, COVID. And so 
that focus of broad attention is both a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, it's the challenge because it means that people are getting a lot of misinformation and uh, all of the, if you will, perverse uh, qualities of uh, social media, amplification of falsehood, distraction into uh, irrelevancies, uh, amp uh, ways in which people uh, lose sight of what's important. All of these, again, when you have a condition that is a matter of life and death, uh, just become uh, ferociously worrying and frustrating. At the same time, this level of attention means that uh, the scientific community speaking responsibly, consistently, coherently, uh, can really make a very important difference to the segment of the public and the policymakers who are prepared to hear uh, and to absorb the fundamental scientific messages. So in addition, uh, perhaps, to the ideas about humility and communication that we talked about earlier, the idea of being consistent, flexible, taking advantage of uh, the full array of vehicles to reach the public, which today fundamentally has to embrace the social media. These are important tools for those of us, again, who care about public understanding, need to take up and to master. Great, thank you. Um, we have about five minutes more left in the session, and there's one question here, and there may be a moment for one or two more, depending on, on what comes in. So, so this question is um, from Laura Scher, reads, you mentioned reproducibility and replicability as two of the key features of science. What are your thoughts on how, on how we as a society, oops, it's moving down on me, on how we, um, we as a society can work to um, improve reproducibility and replicability of our work um, and be scientific leaders in this respect. You mentioned data sharing and I'm wondering if you have further thoughts. Well, thank you very much, David. I, I would like to uh, recommend a report from the National Academies. Uh, it was actually, it's a committee that I chaired uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the report emerged uh, last year, uh, maybe it was even in the turn of the previous, but it's relatively recent on reproducibility and replicability in science. Uh, this report uh, goes through some uh, detail about the challenges and opportunities for reproducibility and replicability in terms of that uh, work, uh, the idea of reproducibility, as I've been describing, is working from the same data and methods to reproduce the results that uh, previously were, uh, were uh, put forward by the original analyst. Replicability uh, refers more to the idea of repeating an experiment, perhaps in a different population, to test whether the fundamental uh, conclusions are replicated in a second uh, study with a different set of uh, data, different uh, participants, and so on. Now, when it comes back to reproducibility for the society, a number of societies with publications have adopted uh, policies about the open uh, sharing of uh, any of the data that underlies models or uh, uh, publication within the uh, journals of the society. And uh, this is one tool that is proving to be effective. There's a society in political science even that actually insists that before publication, and as you know, in political science, many complicated models are put forward of projection and so on, but it insists that the actual code be available and they redo the study with an independent body to ensure that the original results are reproducible. They could be wrong, of course, but they have to be reproducible by the, by the model code and data of the original paper. Now that's a, a, a rather extreme but very telling case of the extent to which open science 
and reproducibility as well as replicability have become uh, more and more salient to thinking about progress across science and certainly when it comes to policy relevant fields uh, in medical decision making and public health policy making. Wonderful. And we have just two minutes, but there's one question that feels compelling, particularly in this time to respond to. It's from Nagin Hajizadeh, and it is, could you speak about how to incorporate the influence of racism, perhaps the more important term as opposed to race, on outcomes? And I, I guess the even more general statement is behaviors in models and particularly um, behaviors that um, maybe um, that are certainly problematic. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, well, racism first for me is uh, a multi-layered phenomena that expresses itself in the hearts and minds of individuals, also in institutional practices, in social mores, and in the lived experience of peoples in marginalized or disadvantaged or biased against groups. And so racism itself is a multi-layered phenomena that when we talk about it from an analytic point of view and we want to incorporate it, uh, I think the first uh, thing to be clear about is uh, what dimension of racism are we really focused on? Is it what's going on in the minds of individuals, in the expressions of institutions? Is it the larger society? Is it the history of prejudice, discrimination, uh, and uh, inequity that is the focus? So that would be the first issue. The second question, racism, like any behavior, you pointed out, the, you know, could you uh, take account of other behaviors? If you uh, if you uh, model behavioral choice, uh, racism as an influence on choice can be, in, a, in principle, modeled the same way uh, degree of a age uh, or uh, sex and gender, male, female, or uh, degree of income, uh, geographic location, any of the things that influence behavior uh, can in effect be incorporated and modeled. What's special about racism in our context is it also can be thought of as a factor in terms of cause, but also an outcome that we care very much about. So that reducing uh, racism, containing the effects of racism, counteracting the history of racism, can be as much of an outcome as they are inputs and determinants from the point of view of modeling. So those are just a few thoughts about uh, what would be a really challenging but important exercise in trying to model more accurately what does and will occur. Um, uh, Dr. Feinberg, thank you so much for um, a, a wonderful session and for your, your ongoing leadership. We are, we are so indebted to you in, in so many ways and so grateful um, for all that you have done and continue to do, so, so thank you. Thank you so much, David. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm gonna turn things over to um, Kathy McDonald again uh, so that um, we can now begin to enjoy um, hearing about the SMDM or COVID-19 Decision Modeling Initiative. Thank you, David, and thank you very much, Harvey, for that marvelous um, talk and overview and, and just incredibly timely. We really appreciate it. I now um, will be uh, giving you some background on what SMDM has been up to in terms of uh, trying to make a, a serious impact uh, on the pandemic. And then we will have uh, a series of panels uh, that I will also describe uh, in brief to orient you to our plans. We've uh, had an SMDM COVID-19 modeling special committee that was formed in the early stages of the pandemic and is led by Lisa Prosser, Jillian Sanders Schmidler, and myself, um, alongside uh, many other members of our community. And it, the idea of the committee at the beginning was to provide connectivity between decision makers and decision modelers. We're working very hard on continuing to make that so. 
uh, this is a part of that. After the committee was formed, uh, we began discussions with the Moore Foundation and um, with their vision and, and our work and, and the work of uh, many, we uh, were able to partner to receive some support to develop a uh, program in which we could uh, offer grants, uh, do a competitive process to offer grants to do work um, on uh, the COVID-19 challenge, um, bringing uh, people from our community and, and beyond uh, into, uh, into the work of, of uh, forming an effort to have uh, sophisticated models, ones that would face the important problems, um, not just be the easily solvable problems. The goal uh, of, of the work of the committee and the work of the, uh, what was named the COVID Decision Modeling Initiative, CDMI, is to provide decision models that can inform clinical health services delivery and policy decision making related to the COVID-19 pandemic. CDMI, this COVID Decision Modeling Initiative, also has uh, the goals of understanding what the key priorities and critical questions are. Um, there's a question repository that's been developed uh, in order to support better decisions and outcomes during the pandemic. I've mentioned the grant making program. That's what will be featured here. And um, we have been working very hard to uh, develop a repository of models so that there's a current uh, one stop place to see the modeling efforts and some of the uh, have structured information available. Uh, and so there's, there's uh, that resource is available too through the CDMI initiative. What we're going to have over the next uh, set of breakout of, of sessions and then later in the day uh, breakouts to get closer to those who've received grants under the CDMI is uh, we're going to be seeing projects that have that are varied, but uh, they're using decision modeling techniques that can aid policymakers and other decision making uh, to get to better outcomes in the face of all of the devastating effects of this pandemic. The focus of the work of um, these grantees, there's nine of them, nine recipients who received grants under the CDMI initiative out of uh, over 60 applications. And, and this group is focusing on public health, treatment and vaccination, diagnosis, testing and evaluation, uh, together combined building a knowledge base to inform the timely and effective response that we're all trying to have to COVID-19. Uh, despite any anything that makes it harder, uh, all, all covered by Harvey's talk recently. We um, will have three panels. The first is focused, uh, each of the panels involves three of the nine uh, uh, grantees and their work, it's ongoing. Uh, uh, they've all started and made real headway and you'll see uh, what they're working on and, and, and have that shared soon. The three panels are uh, clustered a bit around a topic area uh, beyond the, the broad topic area of having decision models to address issues of the pandemic. The first panel uh, starting uh, at 10.05 or in a few moments is on the decisional context uh, of the pandemic. The second panel starting at 10.50 is focused a little bit more on the methods context. And the last panel starting at 11.35 is uh, focused more on the application context, specifically vaccines and treatments. 